I'm Jack Kallmeyer, president of the Dry Dredgers. The fossil project folks asked me to create a video to show how I cut and polish fossils, which is uh, pretty much a hand operation. Uh, one of the uh, reasons for doing this in this area, we have carbonate fossils, and some of them aren't too attractive, so I'll, I'll show you a few to show you why you bother doing this. Here we have a, uh, a bryozoan. Uh, a fossil that only a mother could probably love. It's a uh, massive, not too attractive. If you were wanting people to come over to see your collection, this is not something you pull out to show them, <clears throat> unless you cut and polish it. And when you do that, you can see the internal structures. Another reason to do it for bryozoans is this is the only way you can positively identify this species to the species level. And this is another ugly rock. This is a stromatoporoid. Stromatoporoid is a calcareous sponge, and this also is not very attractive, but cut and polished. You can again see internal growth rings and the internal structure, which is important for identification with this one as well. What we're going to work on today are Solanopra. Solanopra, this is the exterior of a small one. Solanopra is a, classified as a red algae. And uh, also they're not terribly attractive on the outside. On the inside though, they're beautiful. They have a lot of structure that's visible once you cut and polish them. And uh, this one has a story to tell. This little guy here started growth from this point vertically and then apparently started to sag in the sediments and as it sagged it tried to right itself and grow up and finally it fell over and started growing this way with these little buds so there's a lot of interesting information that can be gained by cutting and polishing this is actually the specimen we're going to cut today this is a solenopera also its growth pattern is, is quite a bit different than the one I just showed you. Uh, it almost looks like a little brain. Uh, it's be interesting to see what the internal growth is on, on something like this because it appears that it's growing all directions at once. All of the fossils I showed you so far are carbonate uh, material, which is what we can cut and polish by hand. Uh, this particular fossil is also a stromatoporoid. Here's the external part. Internally, when it's cut and polished, it's even more beautiful than the other ones. This one, though, is silicified, and it's extremely hard. I can, I can cut it, but I can't polish it by hand. So this one I had to have a, a lapidary person polish for me. So that's what we're going to do today, and we'll show you the saw now. The saw is... A probably 1950s or 1960s vintage uh, Felker die met. The base and the frame of this is all cast iron. It's a good uh, strong two-man job to move this. It's a 12-inch diamond saw and uh, you'd think that would allow you to cut six inches but it only allows you to cut about four from the bottom up to the hub. This has a sliding table on it which helps move things through but it's all manual. There is no vice, and that unfortunately is a disadvantage that you have to deal with. I have water hooked up through a garden hose to lubricate it. It's a one-pass uh, water system to cool the blade. Uh, I had to, I got this uh, machine from salvage from the University of Cincinnati. It was uh, in bad uh, repair. They didn't know how to repair it or couldn't repair it, so uh, they allowed me to take it, and I was able to put it back together and make it run again. Uh, the motor on there is a one horsepower motor, which is smaller than the original. The drive system on it, as you can see, there's an open belts and pulleys. It's unfortunate, but that's what I had to do in order to get this thing to operate again. Uh, the original pulleys weren't available and the belt guard doesn't fit anymore. So that's a safety hazard. The other safety hazard is the blade. When this machine is running, you can touch the blade on the sides and it won't cause you any problem. 
but if you were to get in front of the blade and it would grab your finger or hand and pull it down underneath, it would take your finger off. So we don't do that, so you have to be very careful in that regard. So that's pretty much uh, the machine. Uh, we'll set up here to cut, and uh, there will be any narration during cutting. It's loud and uh, wet and uh, a little messy. So I'll put my safety glasses on and earplugs. One of the first things I have to do is make sure the piece is stable. Try to get it in a position to where it's stable even after it's cut. Because if you're balancing on a point that's in, the, in line with the saw, once the saw cuts through that point, the specimen will shift. And so you've got to be very careful with that. And there's the nice and wet as cut piece. Uh, one of the important things when you're cutting is don't overfeed the saw. Don't push it in too hard. Try to make it happen quicker. Even with a one horsepower motor with a thicker piece, you can actually stall this unit out. So it looks pretty good right now. But that's because it's wet. When it dries off, it'll be just dull, uh, which is why we, uh, we polish it. And that'll be the next part of our video. Well, for our next uh, episode of uh, cutting and polishing our Solon Opera specimen, we're going to get started now on that aspect of it, of the sanding, wet sanding, and then uh, finally the polishing. So uh, let me get everything set up, and we'll uh, we'll get going. First thing uh, I want to point out is the supplies we're going to use. This is automotive wet dry paper, silicon carbide paper. And that is the, the uh, grinding media that we're going to use here. And we have a whole stack of different grits. And if you recall, our cut specimen uh, is pretty dull looking at this point. And so we need to get the saw marks out of that. And to do that, the starting paper is 100 grit. And that's a very, very coarse material. So we go from 100 to 220, then 320, then 400, then 600, then 800, 1000, and 1200, and finally, oh, number 1200. 1500 is the uh, finest. Sometimes you don't have to go uh, this far, but uh, that's what we'll do today. And you can see the difference between that 1500 and the 100. This is obviously shiny and reflective because it's so coarse, and this, this looks like flat gray paint. Matter of fact, you can't even feel any grit on it, it's so fine. So that's what we're going to do. And the setup is. What I have here in a uh, laundry tub is uh, a piece of uh, half inch thick Lexan. Uh, if it wasn't all dirty from use, it would look uh, clear as window glass. One thing to note is, as is, 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 is clear and as flat as it looks, it's not. And uh, it's, <clears throat> it's as flat as you can get without getting plate glass. But when you get to the finer grits of paper, that's when it becomes evident. Um, I've got it supported by another piece of Lexan in the bottom, and uh, I wet the, uh, the sheets, and I keep the water running all the time because you do need to have some water to wet things down. I'll show you that as we go. We wet the back of this uh, 100 grit sheet, get it all nice and wet. Wet the Lexan. 
stick it on. Ideally, the water water tension service tension should hold this on here, but uh, in actual practice, some of these sheets tend to curl, unfortunately. And, the, and that's, uh, I guess it depends on the manufacturer of the sandpaper, whose it is. So I've got three clamps that will help, help keep this flat. So now we wet the front of the sheet, and then wet our specimen. Of course, you see when it's wet, it looks a lot different than it did uh, dry. So the trick, if you want to call it a trick, is you're always going to sand in one direction. So for this first paper, we're going to take the, the specimen and sand up and down across the sheet, up and down, until we get all the scratch marks, the saw marks out of this. And I don't know if you can see the ripples in that uh, or not, but uh, there are some dips in this, so it's going to take a little bit of time to get this flat. We keep that going all in one direction so that we can examine it with a hand lens. You'll, you'll want to have a like a 10x hand lens uh, handy <clears throat> to uh, check for scratches. And the idea is all the scratches need to be going in one direction. So you'll, you'll see the saw marks disappear and scratches, parallel scratches, all going one way. When we switch to the next grid of paper, we're going to rotate this specimen 90 degrees and, and rub it the opposite direction until all of the scratches are going this direction and all the ones that used to be this direction are gone. Uh, it does take some time. This first grit takes the longest time because of the saw marks. And, and mostly uh, that's because the saw that I use, as you saw earlier, uh, I operate it by hand. There's no vise. If I had a saw with a vise, you wouldn't have this much um, imperfection in the surface. It would take a lot less time to do it and get it flat. But that's the uh, the key. So it's a <clears throat> it's kind of an Armstrong method. So let's uh, let's get going. See how long this part takes. I try to keep the sheet wet. Uh, if it gets dry, it could be the, the the grit will load up with the material you're sanding off, and uh, you should be able to see it's kind of a white milky. Uh, appearance is that uh, calcium carbonate gets ground down. That's what uh, you're seeing here. Now I'm going to take the specimen off and examine it. And you can see, of course, it's got that on it. I'll rinse it off. And it's not too hard to tell at this point, but I still have a major little dip in it in this area. So we have a little more grinding to do. The one thing that you need to note at this point is once you <clears throat> have removed the specimen from the sanding paper, you need to rinse the specimen and the paper before you put the uh, specimen back down. And the reason for that is <clears throat> sometimes the piece you're, you're grinding will have little pieces of grit on its own come off, little pieces of the rock. And if you happen to put this back down on top of one of them, uh, you'll put a big scratch in what you're trying to, to smooth out, which uh, will then ruin what you've done and you've got to back up to the coarser grits again. So that's a good thing to remember. <clears throat> I'm going to check it again. I find it's good to check it when your arm gets tired. And we'll see. I don't feel like, you know, I see one <clears throat> one, one scratch right here, yeah, one big gouge in it, so still have more to do. Again, this grit takes the longest to get those saw marks out. When you go to the finer and finer grits, they take less and less time uh, as you go between them. Uh, one of the reasons I cut this <clears throat> particular specimen <clears throat> One of the reasons I, I cut this particular specimen was its size. Rather than cut a piece this big for this video, I used one smaller because it's going to take less time. The bigger the specimen, the longer this takes. So uh, this size specimen turned out to be somewhat ideal. <clears throat> Another check. Let's see what. 
I don't feel anything. However, now is the point that you need to use the hand lens to examine it. Gotten past the uh, gross imperfections. <clears throat> So, so the scratches should all be going this way, and I know you'll be able to see that on the uh, the camera, but we'll check it out here. Got a few going the wrong way still, so we'll give it a little, another another uh, little bit of a rub. <clears throat> you'll notice that I'm moving across the paper. That's basically so I don't waste this sheet. I want to use as much of that space as I can. Check. <clears throat> and these uh, sandpaper sheets can be reused over and over and over until they no longer uh, grind off material. Looks good. So now we're going to switch grits to our next after cleaning that paper off. The, uh, this paper can be gotten, uh, where I get most of it, is a, an automotive um, body shop type uh, supply store where you would buy, where body shop would buy paints and, and sandpaper to, uh, to work on uh, cars, paint. <clears throat> the, uh, the first grit that we looked at, the 100 grit, they don't use something that coarse, so that was purchased from uh, a lapidary supply company called Kingsley North, which is where I get uh, that uh, material. And you can buy most of this paper from them as well. But if you want a local source, you can use uh, automotive supply. The box stores like Lowe's and Home Depot sell this type of paper, but you don't, from what I have my experience, you don't have the selection. Okay, so that first grit, we held the stone this way. So now we're going to rotate it 90 degrees and do all of our, our grinding perpendicular to that first one. <clears throat> and we'll check and rinse. Be able to see this paper is starting to curl right down here. It's a, an annoyance. So I'll do the uh, check again with the hand lens. Pretty good, but uh, in this area up here, it, the scratches are still going this way, so I still need to do more work. I'm not applying a tremendous amount of pressure at this point. If I push too hard, it's going to start chattering. And you also have to be careful on a piece like this that's narrow in this dimension versus that dimension. When you're running it the direction I'm doing now, it, it might want to rock. And you don't want that to happen because it'll round off your edges. Check it again. Well, in case uh, any of you are concerned about the plumbing, uh, and doing this when you're grinding like this, this milky material that's coming off is no different than mud. If you're washing some clothes in your washing machine that had mud on it, this is actually probably finer and will go down the drain with no, no issues. Alright, looks like we got it. It's important to be particular about this particular stage and check out with the uh, hand lens to make sure those scratches are all going the direction you want them to. As if not, as you go to finer and finer grits, you'll never get the uh, the other ones out, the ones that are from the coarser grit. All right, so now we're to 320. We're still getting it. <clears throat> but you notice that particular, that 220, did not take very long. I can't promise you that the, it always takes that little amount of time. Again, it all depends on the size of the piece and what you're doing. When checking for the scratch marks in the specimen, 
typically the, the best way to do that is to get reflection off of a light, like we have a ceiling light in here that I try to move the specimen to get the reflection off of it. But uh, hopefully you can tell, compare this to the other, this is the other half of this, the as cut surface and now after we've gone to 220 grit you can see the improvement all right so now we're back to holding this vertically we'll try to get these in there today I'm, I'm only doing this one specimen for the purposes of this this video typically I would do three or four at once depending on the size of the, of the piece. I just felt a little piece of loose grit there. I uh, have to get that off. So I will try this. And now we're looking for scratches this direction. Again with the hand lens. Looks pretty good, but just for fun I'm going to do it one more time. A little bit more. I won't, I won't check it after that because it's uh, it looks pretty good right now. So if you can see the difference now, perhaps it's one one grit finer. The finer and finer grit you use on this paper, it gets more and more difficult to see the scratch marks, even with the hand lens. So you kind of get an instinct of how long you have to go. But you can see these, these particular ones aren't really taking all that long. So the uh, heavier and finer grits are going to take even less. So 400 now. I've actually uh, done this same operation on a hot summer day sitting in a lawn chair using a uh, garden hose as my water source. Of course, you, uh, you do get wet, but that's not all that bad. Alright, now we are going this direction this time. Alright, looking for scratches going this way. Looks like we got it. So we can switch to the next next level. I mean, nothing's uh, terribly critical if you find out that uh, you didn't get it all. When you check the next time, you can always uh, go back to the to the previous grit and start over. It's already getting difficult to see the the scratches even at 400 what that last last one was. Now we're up to 600. Okay, and we're also back to long ways. Got the specimen in this direction. Alright, we'll do a check here. Good, so we can go to the next one, next grip, which is 800. Well, if I remember where I was, I should be going this way this time. Occasionally I forget which direction I was going, I have to go back and look for the uh, scratch marks again. Chatter, so I put less pressure on it. These finer grits are less likely to uh, distort the sur surface overall, because it's just taking a tiny, tiny bit off. Do a quick check here. This grit, 800 grit, it's almost impossible to see the marks. That's how fine they are. And a little comparison. 
on the Jazz Cut versus 800. You might be able to see some a uh, little bit of shininess there. And I'm going to switch to a thousand. You also have to be sure that the Lexan hit doesn't have any grit on it because that'll make a bump in the paper, which will mess up your sanding. Now these, this fine of paper, a thousand and up, it's very easy to snag the paper with the sharp edge of the specimen. And of course it would ruin the, ruin the paper, so it's, uh, one has to be a little bit careful. Again, if you rub your hand on here, it doesn't even feel like it's got any kind of grit to it. Around 90 degrees from that last grinding. Moving this up and down, it feels slick. But you can see that it is actually grinding because you see the little milkiness coming off. So it's taking material off. Check here. The only way you can see scratches now is in a really strong light. But perhaps uh, you can pick up some of the reflectivity. And for some applications, that's probably good enough. So we're going to go 1200 next. Just to get the ultimate. Okay, now we're 90 degrees. You can see the milkiness of the ground off material. I mentioned earlier that the Lexan is not perfectly flat. When you get to these finer grits, once you've used the paper very much, the little ripples in the Lexan will uh, cause problems in the paper and you'll have a, a dark spot where the grit of the paper has been worn off because there's a bump in the Lexan underneath it. But no big deal, you just move around like this and still use the paper. And the last paper we're going to use today is 1500. I have gone as uh, high as 2,000. Alright, for the last one we're back to this direction. Again, it doesn't really feel like anything's happening, but uh, you can see the milky material coming off. Looks good. The other thing I have to point out at this uh, instance is the the dark gray material is matrix that's filled in uh, in this uh, organism. The pinker material is the actual fossil, and it is calcite, very uh, fine grain, and that's what we're polishing. These darker gray areas aren't going to shine. They'll be smooth and all that, but they won't shine, and that's uh, just the nature of this beast. So maybe you can see some of the reflectivity there. That's actually, actually pretty good without doing a final polish, which we'll do next. So we'll uh, clean up here and then go to our polishing station and finish this up. All right, here's our setup for the final polishing stage. Uh, what I have here is uh, on our, our specimen in here and a wash bottle with um, water in it, empty little butter tub, a felt pad, it's about uh, 3 16 thick felt pad, another piece of Lexan, and uh, cerium oxide powder. This is the uh, polishing media and Kingsley North is the uh, place I get it as I mentioned earlier about some of the other material also a toothbrush so um, let me zoom in and then we'll uh, get started this is uh, probably the easiest part uh, but it is what gives you your final results and what I'll be doing to check how good it is is I can move the specimen and get reflected light off of the uh, there's ceiling spotlights in this room 
and when you can actually see it that it's a spotlight that's when it's done right now it's just a dull bright glow on here as I move the specimen back and forth so that's what we're trying to achieve and first thing I'll do is I'll look at my pad and I'll see I've got a couple little dark specks on here and those are little rock chips from the last thing that I polished that need to come off of that pad and make sure all that's off and wet it down this uh, originally was a white pad the cerium oxide is this pinkish color and it's already got a lot of it in it but each time I polish I put a little bit more on there's another little dark speck. This is a very fine powder. You don't need much. thing we need is our our rag. Move that around a little bit. When we were doing the grinding with the sandpaper, I was using this same rag to wipe this specimen off. It's not as critical at that stage. You could use paper towels. But but since this is calcite and soft, once you get the polish, start to really polish it, you need to use cloth, a cotton cloth, so that you don't scratch the surface. So we are ready to go here. And this is also the only stage where the direction you polish makes no difference. So usually on this one I'll do a circular. If you're doing things right you shouldn't see any marks from this. It should just get shinier and shinier. And just as we did with the sandpaper when I pull this up to look at it I have to rinse the specimen off and make sure there's no little grit pieces on this felt. So when I put it back down it doesn't get scratched. This uh, felt pad is also purchased from uh, Kingsley North. I think it's intended to go on something other than what I'm doing but uh, it works just fine. So let's see. The reason This is the reason for the butter tub you rinse the specimen off into that rather than take the chance of rinsing a piece of grit off of this back onto the felt. So, now dry it off. Now I can actually see when I move it I can see the spotlight. No. Hopefully maybe that'll show up in the video as well. And it didn't take much to get it to that stage at this point. This is because we went to a very fine grit in the sanding part of this uh, process. I'm going to keep doing it because uh, I may be able to get it shinier yet. It's possible. The shininess strictly depends on the density of the calcite. If it's porous you'll have a nice smooth piece but you won't get that uh, shine like uh, like you can see a light reflected in it that doesn't mean it's no good it's some things just will not polish that that well and as you can see these darker areas they're not they do not reflect the light like uh, like the pinker areas do so let's just uh, work on this a little more you can do uh, specimens that have dolomite in them the same way Dolomite's a little harder than calcite, but um, silicates you will not be able to do by this method. Yes, that's that's even shinier than the first time around because I can now see the light bulb in the fixture. Before I could just see the fixture, yeah, reflected in that. Uh, And of course, 
this is why you do it. It has beautiful layers in it, the growth, growth structure. And with a hand lens, you can actually see, um, I'll call them cells, whether that's what they really are or not, I don't know. But uh, you can see the internal workings of this particular uh, animal. And again, this is Solanopera, originally classified as a uh, red coralline algae. Um, writing has uh, reclassified it as a sponge. Um, so, take your choice, but either way, it's, uh, it turns out to be a really, really pretty specimen when it's polished like this. And just dry the polished surface off, the rest of it can dry, air dry, and you're done. So, there's the before and the after. That's uh, quite a bit different. This did not take very long. Sometimes it takes a lot longer. <laughs> Again, it depends on the specimen. You know, if it was twice this size, it would have probably taken twice this long, at least. It's all based on the square inches. So, thanks for watching. Hope that was interesting to you. And uh, give it a try. If you can uh, cut your own specimen or you have someone who can cut it for you, that would be uh, a fun project for you to do. Thanks a lot.